This interview is part of the History Heard project. The content of this interview may be used for historical research. However, no part of the video itself may be reproduced without the express written permission of an authorised representative of History Heard. Today is the 29th of November at 4.05pm. This is an interview with Mr. John Harrison in Windsor, United Kingdom. He was born on October 3rd, 1957 in Bevington, Cheshire. Okay, first question. As a teacher at Eton, you see a wide variety of boys in your classroom, such as members of the royal family, future members of parliament, and sons of leading figures in the business world. How does it feel knowing that you can be shaping the minds of the leaders of the future, and how does that affect your style of teaching? That's a good question. It's one of the things you have to think about when you become a teacher at Eton College. Um, it may, mainly gives you a deep sense of responsibility, uh, almost at times a little anxiety, because you are dealing with people who may have influence later on in their lives. So you have a, a very deep concern to encourage them, the boys you teach, to make their own decision-making skills as good as possible. So for history, it's particularly useful because you're telling them to weigh evidence up, but don't believe anything at face value, take time, you know, consider the context. Um, of course, all children are important. The children of the smallest, poorest family in the world is just as valuable as the child of the richest and most important family in the world. They're all sacred creatures. So you want to be sure with everyone you teach that you help them to develop their own decision-making skills. But in this case, you think, oh my goodness, this could be the future prime minister I'm teaching here or the future head of the army or head of the Church of England at the moment, both. Prime Minister of this country and the head of the Church of England are both Old Etonians, so I, I didn't teach either of them. Um, but also, and I, I think some members of staff need to be more careful about this, you must be careful never to give excessive attention to a, a, a student just because they are the son of someone famous. And I think that's so awful when teachers do that or when their parents are rich. Or You've got to be very careful now not to accept presents. We have a system here where if any present is given to you over the sum of £50 value, you have to declare it on an official form to, uh, to make sure you don't get involved with any uh, allegations of corruption. Um, does it affect my style of teaching? Uh, no, I think I am the same style whatever I'm teaching, and I was the same in when I taught at rugby school before I came here. Uh, does it affect my record keeping? Maybe it does because you've got to be very careful when you're going to speak to a, a mother or father who got very little time and they're in a hurry and they're worried about their child or interested or pleased about their child. You've got to make sure you can specify exactly what's going on with their son's work. You've got to be especially careful and make sure you can justify any comment you make or any report you've written to the parents. So my, 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 my record keeping is better than it used to be. Okay, and uh, coming back to the first question, since you teach so many different students from vastly different backgrounds, how do you manage to keep them all on equal footing when they enter the classroom? It's a very good question. It's very difficult because we have to think about it all the time. Um, especially the new boys, you know, the ones that have just kind of turned up at the school, and, and some of them may feel a sense of entitlement if they're rich and powerful or famous. Uh, you've got to have scrupulous fairness, but you mustn't overdo it to anyone who seems to be out of depth or struggling or looks as if they aren't coping, you've got to find a way of coming back to that student with a, uh, an easier question or a better way of phrasing things that they can then respond to so they don't feel behind the other ones. Uh, you've got to be very patient, and uh, this is a quality all teachers need, whatever they're teaching, patient with, with the students who have strange habits or strange views because they may have come from a different background, like you know, you come from Sweden and you, there are different ways of doing things in Sweden. So I never taught you when you were in the first year in the school, but I imagine people had to be careful, oh, well, yes, no, because he's Swedish, therefore he takes this view on things or doesn't think, you know, doesn't have much of the English banter. You're, you're quite a serious person, right? Were you serious when you were new? I don't know, when you were new? I'm not sure. You're not sure? Hey, I guess you were, which is a sort of slightly uh, racial stereotyping that the Swedish people are, are quite serious. Um, sometimes if I'm puzzled about a boy, I can't understand why he said something or did something or wrote something, I have to do a bit of research. So that's changing again my, um, my way of uh, dealing with boys from different backgrounds. You've got to go to the housemaster, usually he's the best port of call, but sometimes the dame, sometimes the tutor, and then you say, why 
is this person reacting that way or why is this person behaving so badly or so well? Uh, sometimes the boy himself, you can say, oh, do you, are you half Italian or do you believe very strongly that the Roman Catholic Church is evil or, you know, what, 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 tell me about your background and they might say, oh yes, my family come from a long Republican tradition and uh, my mother or father have taught me to hate the Roman Catholic Church or, or whatever it should be. Um, but we always take care to refrain from national stereotyping. So you have a sort of name that's unusual, so it sort of flags immediately that, oh, unusual background, but I mustn't therefore think that you will be like this. I've got to let you be yourself. Um, and of course, you must never do racial stereotyping or indeed any other kind of stereotyping. You've got to try and let the different qualities of the different students uh, be visible to you and respond to what they actually are, not what you think they are. Okay, um, so Eton is arguably the most famous secondary school in the world and has seen empires rise and fall since its foundation. In your time at the school, you have seen seven different prime ministers and four different headmasters. What do you think has allowed Eton to maintain its status as a bastion of education for so long? Interesting. It wasn't always the great bastion, it wasn't always the leader. Westminster School, for a while, was the fashionable school in the 17th and early 18th centuries, and it was mere chance. Uh, there were a huge series of public health problems with regards to the slaughterhouses that were just beyond Westminster School's parameter. In the 18th century, there's a lot of uh, plague and there's a lot of diseases, and it became clear that Westminster had no green spaces. Nowadays, they own Vincent Square, but in those days, I don't think they did. And so it was a health problem, and parents wanted a school that was like Westminster, not too far away from London, but what would they choose? Winchester was a little bit too far, so Eton then began to fit the bill. Now, of course, the first Prime Minister of England, of Great Britain, was an old attorney, and he wasn't 1721 before this happened. So already Eton had some powers, so I'm not just saying it's entirely due to health. Though I think its position in a relatively healthy part of the country was important in the 18th and 19th centuries. I've thought a bit about this. I think a Marxist interpretation would be very convincing, which is a rich school. It was founded very well. It was given a lot of land and a lot of money and treasures right at the start. I think that always helps a school to be a good school. I think proximity to London, but not being too close. And London has emerged more and more as the powerhouse of the economy. And indeed, not only the economy, but also of uh, fashion and the arts and uh, in some ways intellect. Although, of course, the first few universities in the country were not at Oxford, uh, so not at London. They were at Oxford and Cambridge. But I mean, from Eton to Cambridge is not that far. So I start again. Eton to Oxford is not that far on the, on the Thames. So I think being close to London, but not too close, being close to Oxford, but not too close. I think this is a geographer's answer. I okay. think it's quite a good one. Um, narrowing it down a bit to what about Eton specifically that might make it better or good system of education, apart from being rich and being close to London, I think the fact that there's a tradition of Opperton boys, now you were an Opperton, so they've always had the rooms of their own. I think that's extremely good for a boy to have a room of his own that he can think what he wants and read what he wants and talk to his friends if he wants and shut the door and keep them out if he wants, rather than being in a big, big dormitory or even a small dormitory. So boys have their own rooms, it encourages independence of thought. Um, there are smaller boarding houses at Eton than most boarding schools. So these opposite houses, although every boy has his own room, they are also quite tightly knit because it's usually around about 50 boys. Only college has got 70. So that's good. I like the way that the dames are quite formidable figures. And I think that really helps the boys to have a, a bigger respect for women and it helps these, the houses to be better run. They're not just matrons that the boys can treat with um, not quite ridiculed exactly, but a certain amount of de haut en bas patronage. You know, dames are quite, they're often women whose husbands were at Eton or a public school. They've often sent their children to Eton or a public school. You don't mess with the dame usually, and therefore the dames run the houses in a very strong and very, very help, helpful way. Um, we've got a resident provost. Now, no other school in the country has a resident chairman of the governing body. So he's around, he goes to chapel, he goes to the sports, he goes to the plays, and he talks to the boys and has the boys round. You know, at the end of lectures and society meetings, you know, he'll say to the boys, come in and have a chat, meet the lecturer. So that's important. Um, I think the academic staff, and I'm speaking as one of them, are very well paid. I, I, I think they're the best paid academic staff for a school in the whole of the country. And that, of course, inevitably encourages a good, you know, competition for teaching jobs. I like the aristocratic tradition of the school, which is that the boys are, to each other and to the staff, polite and they have good manners. And there's a sort of gentlemanly understanding that you don't behave in a disgusting way, which is nice. And lastly, but a lot of my old Italian friends do make this point very much, it's very good for networking once you've left. 
I once had a friend, I won't go through the whole story because it's being recorded, but essentially he said, I'm so glad I sent Alex to Eton because he was working for the European Union and he had a very difficult trade mission to undergo in Africa. And previous people had tried to get this trade mission and hadn't got anywhere. And then he had a look at the cabinets of the governments of this country in Africa and there's someone who was at Eton with him. And so he just got hold of him and said, look, I'm having difficulty to get his trade negotiations getting going and, you know, could you help me? And the man said, of course, my dear chap, of course. So the networking does exist, let's face it. And I think this is one reason why Eton therefore attracts a lot of good quality um, boys trying to get into it. Um, a last question here. Uh, Eton has been around for almost 600 years and the pace at which the school has evolved is a lot slower than the world around it. Do you feel that maintaining traditions is a big reason why Eton is so successful? Or could it be said that a faster rate of progress could be good for the school? I didn't mention tradition in any of, uh, of the answers I gave just a second ago. So tradition is not high on my list of reasons why Eton is a success. And it is certainly annoying to see some of the slownesses for reforms taking place that really you feel should be taking place. However, my main answer to this is I do think the traditions have been one of the causes of Eton's success. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the philosopher Edmund Burke. He was one of the 18th century English uh, politicians, but his view, generally speaking, just to paraphrase it very crudely, is that if something exists, that there's a reason why it exists. So before you are going to abolish it or very radically reform it, you have to be very careful that you have understood why it exists and, and that you must take it seriously. And if it's a tradition, that might be a rather healthy thing. And I'll give you one example. Now, school dress, I'm not wearing it at the moment. I would have done it. Ask me to. I'm just wearing ordinary clothes, but you are wearing school dress. And in the 1960s and 1970s, school uniform was mocked in a lot of progressive schools. The children could wear whatever they wanted to turn up in the morning in. And then it turned out, when the discipline problems and troubles with you know, bad, very, very bad behaviour and drugs and bullying, that actually um, wearing a school uniform helped to reform the behaviour of the pupils. They actually liked it. So there's a tradition that actually does help pupils feel pride in themselves and in their school, and it is a very beneficial thing. Um, maintaining tradition is, is a sort of signifier that this is a, a, a rich and powerful and confident institution and I think that the pupils get a certain amount of the confidence and the um, gracefulness by knowing that they're in an institution which is a powerful and confident, slightly strange institution. Um, are you aware of Saussure and the idea of semiotics of the way of, of symbols? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, leaving aside school dress, thing, things like um, uh, leaving aside the chapel for Christian reasons, which is another reason why I think it's a good tradition. Um, things like the tradition of chambers, the traditions, this won't mean many things to people listening, but some of the stranger traditions about the way the boys behave, um, even relatively new ones like the legate when they protest against, um, they protest against a, a piece of work by the headmaster they don't like. Um, anyway, all these traditions, of which there are many at Eton, uh, including the strange language, I think actually are, are signifiers. They're signifiers this is a rich and old and powerful institution and, and it probably is a good thing to belong to it. It probably will be helpful to you to take these seriously. I'm not saying that every tradition should be maintained forever. It's a kind of um, historical memory which I like as I teach history and I think it helps a toleration for eccentric and absurd and odd boys and indeed eccentric and absurd and odd teachers and I rather like that toleration. Okay, thank you very much, sir.